One, two. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Brent Park for the Q&A today with Mark and Nicola. Thanks very much for your attendance. Uh, it's really good to see so many people. Uh, just give you a rundown of how, how, how the evening's going to work. These questions have been split into three categories. Uh, football questions, um, match day experience questions, and then the third section is the range of other issues. So we'll tip... These are the questions that have been emailed in, so Nicola and Mark will go through them. And then at that point, if there's any other questions relating to that category that you want to ask from the floor, we'll take them in each topic. So we'll go through the football ones. If there's any football-related questions, we'll take them. Then the match day experience. And then finally, any miscellaneous or other topics that haven't been covered. So uh, I'll hand over to Nicola to go through. Um, Okay, thanks for all, all for coming. Um, we're not going to do a sort of set piece bit at the beginning of this because uh, people always question whether we're avoiding having questions, so we're going to switch entirely to questions tonight, so you can ask whatever you like. But I'm going to start with you that have been emailed in on the football. Um, one from Jack Bowie, uh, who was in charge of so sourcing signings for the squad, and then who ultimately makes the final decisions on who we sign? Was it Mickey, Borny, or you? It was me. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, I think it's important to note that y yes, you do want to understand who makes the signings. No more than I do. Because if you make the wrong sign in here, you know, we weren't like hell to get the staff to get the house and put it up to the house to secure where they are to pay the ticket prices. If you get a long time in here, I mean, it costs us 250000 to 400000 over two years. So it's something that I looked at, in particular in 2019, and we've been moving towards what we do now. So I think to explain it, I'd just like to go through the process as to what happens. And I'll tie it into specifically where we were uh, this year. So the first thing is um, we have to decide how we want to play. There's no point in recruiting people just on the basis of second line training around that we work out how we're going to play after that. So we specifically have to decide how we were to play. The other side to it was to look at, you know, at the club, what we want to do is to actually develop players. And this has always been on the agenda, especially for a club like ourselves. So we want to develop players. We want to know how we want to play. And then the third thing that comes into it is how do we balance the squad? Because you don't have the squad on day one. You build that over a period of time. And I'll we'll talk a little bit about the window as well and how that works. Because then you can see the difficulties you have. Because that last thing, the balancing the squad, is one of the things that, you know, you say, oh, we've got 15 cents of ours, etc. Um, so I'll come back to that. So they're, they're the things that sort of drive the type of player we want. So if I just take how we want to play, um, there's a lot of people look at it and say, you know, uh, we want to play with a back three, or we want to play with a four, or we want to play with a four, four, two, or we want to play with a diamond, etc. Um, I really don't give a stuff how many we have at the back. You know, whether it's three at the back, or whether it's four at the back, it's four, four, two. The answer is that what you want to do is to get your best players on the park, and get them in the best.
best positions in the past. But I think, just looking at what we've got at this point in time, I think, I'm sort of disagrees, we've got two of the best formats in this league. And the answer is to get them up the field. Now, that isn't the end of the game, but that's one of the main things that we want to do. So, how do we play? 4 4 2. If I went to Salford, I don't say to Mickey, we've got to play three at the back. I don't know. I know sometimes when you guys are looking at the club, it's almost like a soap opera. You know, you want you want confrontation between the manager and the chairman. And this one. It doesn't happen that way. And uh, I'll come back to this process because we sat down at the end of last season and we looked at the season, which is what we should do. And as a group, we debated what we wanted to do and do differently. Personally, I sit down the halfway line and I think we need to play further up the pitch. And that is absolutely consistent with what we've tried to do. That's and all the coaches agree with that. We play too deep, etc. I'll come back to it. We've got these full backs and we've got to get them on the pitch. Now, if you go to, but you've, what you've got to do is be pragmatic and not dogmatic. You've got to change when things change. I sat down in the stand in Salford and I looked at that and I saw him play at my other team, so he's playing, playing 442. I don't, I don't know before we play. I don't know, I don't speak to Nicky before we play because I don't really want to influence how he does it. But when they lined up, they lined up, for all those coaches amongst you, with a very wide three. Now, if we played with three against that, we'd have had three against one in the middle. They had a ten who was floating and drops in the island all the time. And you've got Watson, who we know runs forwards. And we'd have been playing with a back five for a year. So, with a football, you could actually pick and fact and you could get your lads up the pitch. The lads are wanting to get up the pitch, and that's what we did consistently. So, it isn't about a rigid way we want to play, it's about the principles that we want to play, which is to get our best players in the best positions. And if they change, if you have different things, but we want to basically to, and we sat down as a group with the coaches, and we all discussed it, and we all came to the that this is what we're going to try and do. So that then takes you into recruitment. I know this is a long answer to it, but it's not that easy as who made the final decision. And in terms of that, we decided on the types of player we wanted. We've got some in the building already, and then we go out. And in between that, and before we actually got to the end of the season, we've been taking data from all of the players around the place. So we were able to target and pick up things like Reese and the player, Bisto and so forth. And what Morley does down is goes and tries to speak to their agents, to their clubs, and so forth and so on. So there is a process that gets us, and it's no accident that we've got these players. Just one thing I would say, um, you know, we, we had injuries at the start of the season, and that causes problems. Because if you're actually looking at getting your fullbacks forward and you want to play with a four at the back, it's far better if you've got people like Morris and Hawks who roll in. They ain't got the pace to be an out and out winger and go down the outside. So they roll in and they get shots away and they score like he scored against Bolton. The Hawks will do the same thing. But the important thing is also there's a platform to play into. So the fullback will play into Morris and then go beyond Morris. And you can still get him out the back and you saw that. So it doesn't really matter whether you're playing. If we play against the three, I bet you Mickey will match him up. And then we have a battle with the wing backs. Who can, who can determine the best? So what I'm trying to say is you determine the way you want to play, you look at the players you can recruit. Yes, there's a budget around it, but we then put the data into it and we pick up these guys who have the statistics that we wanted to see in terms of the ability to be athletic and get up and around the park. Uh, what, what they do in terms of whether they pass forward or they don't, and so forth and so on. So that then takes us to the data, and the data then decides on, identifies the players, the players then we look into the background, we look into the social media, and um, we try and do a deal with them. And then there's actually an investment document now, but as I said before, you can sign a player and you can, I'm going to say piss away, that's what I'm going to say. Uh, three hundred thousand pounds, four hundred thousand pounds. If, it, if it's the wrong guy, 
So there's quite a lot of work goes into any one signing, and everybody's fingerprints are literally on that signing because I make sure that every single coach, the manager, and the data guys, and and the <coughs> sporting director all sign up and say what they think on that form. And at the end of it, I sign as the last, and that's really you know, the stamp on it. So I'm the last person who signs it, but I've never turned down anything that's gone through that process. I've never turned the word there. So I'm basically a rubber stamp at the end of it, making sure that everybody's done their bit and deciding what they want. I just, I just, but it is important, it's probably the most important thing to you guys at the club in terms of how we recruit the players and, and for me it's, it's something that is massively important and I think where we've got to is that you've got some, I, I don't know, I'll ask you the question, do you think you've got good players out there on the pitch this year? First time for a long time and age was massively important in this. Our average age, I think, at Salford is 23.4 or something. Our average age last year was 27. It's one of the youngest teams. Therefore, you have to accept you've got to be patient with them. You've also got to look at the impact of and, and, and this is important, the window itself and how they sign things. So, if you then get to looking at signing players, what happens is, at the top end, in terms of the Premier League, they all go abroad, they come back, they're making decisions who's going to be in the squad, who's not going to be in the squad, and some of them roll down into the championship, the championship do a little bit, some of them roll down into the league, league one, and then into league two. So we're at the bottom of the pile because we're league two. So even before we start the training, sometimes we, 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 well, we very often don't have a full squad. We do the best that we can to get there. But before we get to the, the start of the season, people like Turnbull, Turnbull's a good player, so he is a good player. So we're targeting good players and they want to play in League One. So they try to get into League One right to the end, right before the, the season starts. So you get Turnbull in, he's been training during the summer, but he's still not match fit, you've got to play games to be match fit. So we don't really get him into position until like the second week of the season, third week of the season. And you then come to the window and you look what you try and do in the window, and that's even worse. And you know, the last day of the window is a nightmare. For me, um, I'll tell you now, we missed out on four strikers on the last day of the window. We lost one at about nine o'clock in the morning. And then what happens during the day, it's so frustrating, you know, Vaughan rings, we all say, no, so and so's not gonna happen. And then he rings me back an hour later, actually it's gonna happen. And then an hour later, it's not gonna happen. And this went on right the way through the day. And the reason for that is because we're shopping in League One. Pick players in League One that will make us better. And of course, what they're doing the League One clubs, they're trying to bring players in from the Championship or whatever. And so they won't release this player until they've got a player in. And that day, we went right the way through. And at the end of the day, so we had players on the end of the phone that we couldn't bring in because they're talking about that go. So it's not within our gift. And you know, that's the way that it is because of the structure and everything else. So I think it's important to note all of that. And then when I come to the, the, the final bit, which is the balance of the squad, as you're going through the close season, the, the pre-season, you get players injured. And we had so many players injured this season that we scored through, which is why we had to cover off at the back. And again, I think I'm fairly comfortable at the back now, but we've got players who, if we're playing forwards the way we want to play, they've got pace to recover. If Bristol could give the ball away, give him 10 yards and still get back and recover. Same with on the other side. It's a long answer to it, but it's the most important part of, I think, the club that you're interested in. You're interested in what we're doing in terms of you know, building this or doing this or doing that off the pitch. I know that when I was at the FA, nobody ever bothered about what we did off the pitch. They just wondered what the England team were doing and what the discipline system was doing. So that's just a say to you that this is an important part it isn't just well, yeah, he seems like a good player, we'll sign him. Okay, the next question is sort of related to that. This is from Adam Miller, which is, are we looking at recruiting a new sporting director? The answer is, is that there's a role for a sporting director here. Uh, I won't do it until we get the right person. Vaughan was the absolutely ideal person. 
a lot of respect in the dressing room, which is massively important. Uh, I'd work with Mickey, uh, which again is important, and, and, and a bright lad. Um, he carries himself well. You know, and then when you know this at the end of his con well, not the end of his contract, the middle of his contract, instead of doing what a lot of pros would do, to be quite honest, which is to come and pitch money and play a game, get the treatment table. He just came to me and said, I can't do it physically. I gave up his contract with us. And you know, after a couple of months doing bits and pieces, he, he wanted to come and learn the job. So we brought him in. So you've got to have the right guys, the first thing. We are covered off and I've been spending quite a bit of time. I mean, Everton have nicked our head of education. Everton have nicked our sporting director. Everton tried to nick our head of community. I mean, this is a Premier League club, and barely a Premier League club that died out of cons. Right? So we must be doing something right in terms of the feel of the people we've got, and we could just stop nicking them. Well, I'll put, well, I'll put them on a contract that we sell them. <laughs> Sorry, so are we recruiting new sports director? There's various things that we're doing within the guys in the team who are all part of that process, and we're just tightening that up and strengthening that. Um, and I'll also get some more help in the market because that's where we really need the information. So we'll have the data that we have in the moment, it's just actually that market information. If we recruit somebody, it, it will be over a period of time, but there's, there's stuff to do now that we, we need to get on with other than that. Um, are we happy with the recruitment transfer business from the top of the southern window? I, I dealt with that, I think, unless anybody's got any questions. Um, how does our youth set up work? But, we don't necessarily have a youth set up, I did explain this last time, but I'll, I'll explain it one more time. Um, we've gone to picking up players who have been in Category 1 systems, basically, and we're actually doing the finishing touches, so we're almost the finishing school. McLeo was at Norwich, and he was, he'd done some um, stuff in, in Scotland as well. Um, so uh, you, you're talking of Hawks, you're talking of Sunderland, you're talking of uh, O'Connor is a classic, Man United started, you know, unfortunately away this week because they were on the 21s and so forth and so on. So we're bringing these guys in, uh, Reese from Rhys Hughes, Welsh under 21, etc. Could have gone to other clubs, wanted to come to us to develop. So that's what the policy is we, and beneath them we're taking players in um, what we call our, our development area. And it's, the, it's really the gap, what were the young pros after our academy? And these guys were bringing in everything you saw, which is where Max came on against Bob. Um, they're the guys, we've been getting other, these, other, others of these guys out into men's football. We've got to play games at that age. So we're, we've got them out again, but they're not just put out of sight with, with the end of them. Okay, one last question that's been emailed in first, and we'll go to questions from the floor on the football. Um, this was around what's what were the season expectations laid out for Mickey Mellon, and are we on course to meet them? And that's from Carl Christie. Thanks, Carl. Um, management textbook questions. What are the expectations? Um, I've said this many times. I'm asked what targets you set. I'm not setting a benchmark so that people say, "Oh, I didn't do that. You've got to sack him." Etc. And that's just the way that it is. The expectations of this club is we'll always challenge for promotion. And even if this year is, it is it's not an experimental year, but it's a transitional year, as we move to this change of, you know, you've seen the change. You've got a young team, you've got some exciting prospects in there, uh, and we just got to get it together. Yes, we missed out on strikers, um, but, you know, we had the strikers certainly. You know, but the expectations are that we'll challenge for promotion. Um, I have to say that. Uh, in the first 15 minutes of the season against Stevenage, I sat there and I thought, Christ, did we mess this up? Yeah. <laughs> and we just got it completely wrong. Uh, but then, what I would say is, and you've, got to, you've got to take this, as you don't take it. Start the season, they suddenly were hit with a load of old pros who won every 50-50 for 15 minutes and they went one down. And they actually fought, them, fought their way back into that game, you know, and, and then I saw that again against Bradford, and I've seen it several times. So, for me, that was, that was a good test for them. But, you know, we, we, I never look at the league until 10 games have gone. Because of the reasons I've said before, you, you're quite unstable as you go into that period and we sort it out. 
Um, I'm asked the question here about uh, are we happy? Sorry, um, what was it? Are you on course for me? Are you on course for me? The four games, yeah. yeah. It's just four, games. four home games. Yeah, yeah. that's like four games, isn't it? Mean. Oh. Oh, four home games, in. that's why. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I was looking at something else for the games. Um, the, the, the answer is 10 games were, were under when we would be, but then how many times have we been under? And then back in by January, February. In, in this way, you get a run of five or six games and you get up there. So, um, from anywhere, I've lost touch and uh, it's achievable. Do you want to go to questions before? Yeah, any more questions before football? Just going back to the first question, who makes the recruitment decisions? In your answer, you were saying, we want this, we want that. Is that you wanting that as the chairman, or you've employed the manager that you think is right, spoke to the manager and told him your expectations, and with your with the manager's answers said this is the right manager for what we want as a club and then leave the job to the manager and he comes to you and says i want player x y and z you then say unfortunately out of our reach but we will look and then it goes okay he's not here anymore but then it goes to vorney and vorney says we can't have them, or her second best, and that appeals to what you as the manager that we're employing to, to get us as far as we are. Or are you telling the manager of what we need as a club? Sorry, I thought I answered that the first question. It took about half an hour to answer the first question, I thought I answered that. No, I'll come back to it again. You know, if you're saying, do I tell the manager what we want? I have a view as to what this club wants. But we sit down, I said, right, at the start of the, at the end of last season, we did a review and we sat down, we took the data that we had and we looked at the data and we looked at the data that had the successful teams in this league over the last few years and we decided, you know, there were things like they actually won the ball higher up the pitch, they actually had more chances as a consequence of that. So when you take it right in the round, you then say, okay, that's how we want to play. And then I said, we get to the type of player that we want and actually say, okay, let's go get that. Now, you haven't got an unlimited budget, so I set a budget that fits in with what we, what we can afford. And actually, every year since we've been here, we've made a loss, which means that we put more in the budget than we've actually earned. So that's been an investment in the budget. So uh, when we get to uh, what Vorley does, uh, we have a, 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 a spreadsheet that actually shows all the players we've got, because we'll have some from last year, and we'll be able to work out how many players we think we need, says 25, 26, or whatever, and we, and we plot you know, what, what's going to be, when I say we, it's, it's quite easy to think go away and do it, because they'll come back and show me, and it'll show we've got cover of the fullbacks, isn't that good? That's what I'm talking about, getting the, the balance of the squad, and you can look at what they're going to bring in loans, and not bring in loans, and there's a budget figure. And so when you start to do the maths on that, you can work out how much you can spend. But equally and most important, and I mentioned this before, there's a market knowledge of what you pay for players, right? So you know what you pay and we don't pay for players. And I can tell you now, when we had COVID, for example, what other restrictions did you have on that? Well, we weren't going to be signing players on two-year contracts because with all due respect, and nobody was, unless it was a Salford, unless it was a Mansfield, unless it was those clubs. And there was a wage cap coming in, and so what they actually tried to do was to jump the gun. They were paying a fortune for players, and we couldn't match that. We weren't going to match that, and then, you know, the, once the, the deadline had gone. So what I'm saying is there's a budget constraint on it, but it's telling the maths. You know, if you've got 25 players, you've got a budget of X, even if you gave them all the same wage. Uh, there's only a number of players, only so much you can pay a player. And that's the important thing is to read across into the market. And Steve Beck used to have all that information, Vaughan had all that information this year, and so that was all much played in. So 
within that constraint, you then search for the best ways you can get. And that's where the data comes in. And so you, you know which players are around. And then you budget it and you, and you do that. So I'm sorry, I'm repeating what I said before. But what you're trying to get at, you're trying to get at that I actually tell the manager who he can have. Not get at, but that's the question I was asking, because you were saying we. Well, so we, 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 we is we, it's not me and Nicky. We <laughs> is me, Park okay. Heath, the manager. manager, Hodgie, Sorry. not Hodgie, um, Parky, Dorsey, uh, Mickey, Vaughan, and me. So on the sporting director thing, because I'm, I'm not a big fan of sporting directors. <clears throat> not am I. So for that's what reasons. I'm trying to get. If you're a sporting director, if you go to a different club, a sporting director does different things. And it's, it's actually, I was talking last night, I had a talk after dinner speech, and I was actually telling them that if you look at the industry of football, it isn't a mature industry. You know, and it, it's a little bit of a joke in terms of some of these titles. And I've actually got somebody who's gone on a course who rang me yesterday and said, can I come and talk to you about what, what you want from a sporting director? And that's why I'm saying to you, it has to be tailored to what we have here. Because there is, I can't go out and recruit everybody here. And actually, I wouldn't do it. All the people that have been nicked from us, I've had to train them up. Because you won't find them out there. I won't go to Liverpool and find you know, a sporting director who work for us. I won't find a comms guy that will work for us out there. And I'm, am I going to go to, I don't know, um, Hartlepool and get somebody? No. Because it's just where we are, just where the industry is. So when I say we, I mean we. It's on the coaching staff. And I'll, and in the meeting, I'll sit there and I'll put my so, so out of that, you get your sporting director, your manager, and say, as a club, this is what we're after and then does the manager then say well this is how i play as a manager and these are the type of players that i feel that this club could go forward and then does the sporting director then say no you can't have them players because as a club we want different players and that sort of i don't know who that question is coming from the, 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 the manager the manager was in on the discussion as to how we've got to play I, I can remember Mickey going, I can play with three at the back, get the Sabuti on board and put the players on the Sabuti on board. Well, that's what I'm coming with that question is because a lot of people outside are saying it's down to Vaughan, it's down to Mickey, it's down to you. It's not, so it's, that's it's, what it's, all it's, I'm it's, trying it's, to do. It's down to a collection of people. And that's what you've answered. And, and, and you know, when, when you, the, the issue is that we've changed from where we were two, three years ago. So we have to have the manager. We got two years ago, but Mickey's flexible enough to deal with that, and you know, he understands. I mean, what you do if you're looking at football, to be quite honest, it's like that. Very short term. So the manager will have a, a nightmare of a day when he loses, and so forth and so on. And you see other clubs will be sacking managers after three losses or something like that. I don't like that because I think you should have more of a evolution of a period of time. So it makes life better for everybody, but actually it makes more sensible decisions. So I always say to Mickey, we never turn a disappointment into a crisis. But the quid pro quo for that is that you have processes that you stick to, and you don't throw the processes out the window because you've got to run about results or whatever. And the way I look at it, and I've always looked at it this way, is that I look at the performances. Because if the performances are there, and the points aren't there. You know, of course, at some stage, you look at the points, but if the performances are there, then I'll stick with the manager. I'll talk to the manager and say, what about, what about, what about, and I'll get the views. And more so now, I actually, this, this last 18 months, I've dug further into all of this, and I have a little bit to offer on that. In terms of, I've been, I've played, I've actually been at the FA, and I've seen them develop the coaching there, and how you develop it, and stuff like that. So I do have a valid opinion. Uh, I don't force it on people, but when the next manager comes in, he's going to come into a process. He isn't going to determine the process. Now let me just roll you one last time. I know it's taking a long time, but this is massively important. You don't see this. The front end of the football processes of recruitment, development and management is a very short term environment. And it's where you put managers. So if you're looking at managers for League Two, they're either at the end of their career 
and they'll be got the next two or three jobs, and they'll play for eight, they'll be there for eighteen months, and when they go, it's yeah, yeah that's football, and you're off to the next job. Or you get young coaches who come in, and what do they want to do? They want to leave and go. Look, look, it's Forest Green. So why on earth would you let that guy shape all the processes that take two, three, four years to produce what you want to produce? You wouldn't. So what you do is you build him into the process and so the next guy that comes in fits in with that or doesn't come. It's as simple as that. And I say the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You know, what are you looking at? We try to get younger players, more athletic players, and we try to play forward a lot more. We haven't got the strikers that we were looking to bring in, and that's the disappointment for the window. But we means the people who are responsible for the football in this club. Any other questions? Any other football? Evening. Um, you've mentioned using data quite a few times. Do we use data more or less than other clubs? And has the concept of a gut feeling about a player's worth gone now? No. Uh, the, the, sorry, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> Change completely. Um, I'm told by, I, I couldn't go to the, the conference, but I'm told by the guys, our guys, that when they went down to the conference with, with Opta, the, the way we were using the data was the best, certainly in the lower leagues. And if you took to different kettle of fish, if you're talking about Man City and I've got about 50 people doing data, data searches, but they're trying to find people in the jungles of Borneo and stuff like that. Um, the way I tried to use the data here was to actually stick it into, um, first of all, into what I call the management end. You know, so it's the training, it's evidence based training. So our guys, if they haven't won their duels, we identified last season what we wanted to, the, the stats that were the type of stats that made us win games. If we win more than 50% of the duels, we tend to win games. If you run a certain distance, you tend to win games, you know, and so forth and so on. So, you do that, and then when you get the players themselves, so they get they give me a set of data after the game, but the other week, and I said, well, hang on a minute, um, go back and tell me what pick the bones out of this, and tell me exactly what you think happened on the day. Now, anyone match is different because you know they don't play a certain way, they've got confidence, you know, they look on the day, whatever. But um, the, the the way we use it, I said, well, okay, now tell me how you how that is dealt with on an individual basis, what it means for every player, and what it means on a unit basis, what it means for you know, back four or back three or you know, the wing backs plus the mid advanced player, uh, and what it means on a team basis. So what it then set in that week, so what it tends to do is to shape the training, which, which is then tied into the data and what we're trying to achieve. Now, it's all sad. Do we do more of that? I think we do it better, and I think we do do it more. Um, than people around us in our league. And it's been quite, but then you take it from that into the types of player that you want and you get a consistency across the club. In terms of you know, the gut feel and needs to go to play, one of the things you've got to be very careful, careful of with data is confirmation bias. You know, so I can see somebody who gets the ball as a fullback and he, instead of going forwards, he checks and plays it back. And I can, and when I'm sitting there halfway down, I can see them all get behind the balls. I hate that, because I know we've got to break them down again. And if you get lads out of the under-23s, that's the way they want to play. Which is different, because you know, there they'll play and try and get another one. So it, it, it is used, and we, we've got to be very careful that it doesn't just confirm what we're seeing. But it jars against what we're seeing. That's where it's more interesting. Because you know, so actually, sounds as good player, but actually, he gives the ball away quite a lot. And the other thing is, if you've got players down at this level, one of the things we're trying to do is that you focus on their strengths. You know, because if you have somebody, players down this level have got everything, but you might have somebody who's you know, great fullback getting forwards, but on a one on one, I sit there sometimes and the feathers fly, doesn't fancy a 50 50. And you look at that and say, well, actually, if we really work on that, we might get him from a five to a six, you know, out of ten. You won't make that much difference to him. 
put a freaking thing on his strengths. So I'm not picking on anybody. If he's fast and he can cross the ball on the run, then we'll get him into a position whereby he'll be a winner for us on the day. But actually, over a period of time, we might be time for a week to sell as well. So that's where the development comes in. So we use the data for the recruitment, for day to day management, and therefore for the development. Any other football questions while we're back here? Mark, you um, referred earlier to budget constraints being one of the part of the process of bringing players in. You often used to refer to us having a top third budget. Is that still the case? And if it isn't, have you any idea roughly where you'd pitch it now? I just say, I used to refer to the definition of a self-sustainable club as having a top third budget in whatever league you play in. And uh, if you've read the poem If, you'll find that people sort of um, read the poem If and look up for the line in it where people take your words and twist it to make a trap for fools. So that was always an aspiration to get into being a self-sustainable club. What I've just said to you is we're not self-sustainable at the level of the budget that we use because we make a loss. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, I don't really know where we are budget-wise because you don't get told the truth by visiting directors and so forth. We did try for a number of years to try and get to the bottom of that. And the only way you can do it is indirectly by having good market knowledge and good market intelligence. You know, so for example, um, I won't mention the club, but I, I know that you know, they have no chance of buying or bringing in players that we were bringing in. in, the, in but I, I just don't know. I'm, I personally am good enough market intelligence. So the way I work it is we know roughly where we are budget wise and what we can do and what, what we can achieve. And we stretch it every year. Because you know, if we're making a loss, we're stretching it as far as we can. And that's cash going out of the club. Um, I, we've got projects on, um, and if you wanted to talk later about you know, the new stadium, uh, that. that is what it is, but there's a project before the new stadium which is about expanding the campus. Now I think um, if we get the um, the campus deal through, then, and that may take us two years, that I think gets us a relatively self-sustainable League One club, um, because there's lots of business that falls off the back of that. And you just do the best that you can in the interim. I mean, because we have come through a fairly difficult period. You know, when you look at it, and since we've been here, I keep saying that we, you know, we got relegated, we couldn't stop that. You know, three years in the non-league, and the money that we lost on that. Then you know, back-to-back promotions, and then back again down to League Two, and the money you lost in coming into League Two. Uh, you pitch collapse, <laughs> something you quit just gone. Uh, and, and so forth. And then COVID, of course, don't forget that. Uh, and there's long COVID. You know, people talk about gates, and we'll talk about that a bit later on, but if there is a budget, and the problem is we've got to try and manage um, and keep what we've, what we've got on the pitch and, and get to the point where we can help sell some players, um, which will contribute, but we don't rely on selling players. And we've never done that because we wanted to perform on the pitch. And you know, I keep saying I, I could have sold the world 15 times, but I didn't. And we, and we wanted to get to the, see him play out his contract because he wouldn't sign a new contract with us. And that's the way we were at this point in time with developing players in a system that we think will produce players for us. And so that'll go into the budget and so on and so on. But everybody talks about the budget. The budget is, is fairly flexible because I'm comfortable with the budget. I know sometimes if we have to do things, we know we have injuries and stuff like that. I'll do that. I hate giving the figures to somebody. And you know, I'll give it to Vaughan in the, in, the, in the spreadsheet that I have, and we'll just talk about it. That gives him a, a broad, a broad um, blueprint. But if something great came up and we could do it, then fantastic. Yeah. You know, and if we have a cut run, uh, a good cut run can be three hundred fifty thousand to five hundred thousand pounds to us. Get to the third round. But don't forget, we started this conversation. You sign one player on, there's your cut run gone. It's, it's a family balance thing. 
So I'm feeling dodgy, but just repeat it one more time. When I said that, I said, nobody's defined a self-sustainable club. I think if you, you have a top third budget in whatever league you're in and you break even, that's, you know, that's self-sustainable. You know, we, we strive to get there. And as I say, you know, we're not there yet. Okay. I think there's one other football question. Two, is there any others after these two for football before we move on to match day? Okay, so we'll just take these last two. Um, I just, there's been a lot of talk about data this evening. Do we use data to identify the leaders within the group? Because you've moved to a squad with a, a, a lower age. We've seen a lot of experienced players leave last summer. And sometimes on the pitch, we do look like we may be lacking some natural leaders. Um, you know, Kane's our captain, and I think he's somebody who maybe leads more uh, by example and being maybe like a, a, a leader of them, like a Peter Clark. So I just wanted to know what the club's take on that was, really. Yeah, again, I said at the start, you look at the balance of the squad as one of the factors that you look at. And one of the difficulties we've got for a young squad is that you're not going to find too many guys who've got the experience and feel they understand what they're doing. So uh, the answer is no, we don't pick somebody because he's just a leader. Yes, we like to get good characters into the dressing room, um, but it's one of, the, you know, one of the downsides of having a younger squad. Yeah, but I like players. I mean, if you're looking at Kane, Kane is, but we've, we've had a period where we've had some really hard nosed, um, hard bitten professionals who have been in the scouts dressing room. It's quite tough, I'm telling you, but I'm fine. And, and these guys, we don't have. And yes, we do miss that. But that's why I look at it and say that you've got to be patient. But I alluded to it before it's difficult when you, you start your first game of the season with your new teammates and you're getting absolutely bored for the first 15 minutes of the well, season. You probably knew that was coming because we had a lot of Stephen Hitch be set up like with the managers of the cup, so it strikes me as a surprise that the players were surprised by that. How many games you played over there? Sorry? How many games you played over there? No, I can tell you now. That's, that's a that's a no, no, it's not. I can tell you now. You can say what you like in the dressing room, but when you get out there, it's a totally different kettle of fish at times. They were younger, they were young pros, and, and actually, they're the signage for me. They just got old pros. They won every single 50 50. And then, you know, what you're trying to do is you, you start to look around to see if somebody can, can give you something, a spark, or whatever. And gradually, that team got back into it. So for me, that was a plus point. But I, I take your point, and, you know, it's a very valid one. We have to get the balance of the squad right, but we, you know, we, we particularly not gone out to get players um, you know, who have got that experience, and, and you try to get it. You know, if you're looking at um, uh, Turnbull, we were after him for a long time. He's a good, good lad. He's a leader. He's a, leader. He's a very, he's a very, he's a different leader. He's not a clarky leader. It's like a Rolls Royce out there at times, you know. But you then start to look at your keeper, and we've got young keepers, and he's very young for a keeper. And uh, one of the questions there, because you know, they're the guys who you can listen to um, Joe when he's in goal, he's brilliant. You know, to play in front of that would be great. But you know, we've got young keepers, which is a bit of a worry. Um, but no, we haven't. We have it's, it's just one of those things we can't. We can't. We just can't manage it anymore. Last question. You said before, Mark, that you look at performance as opposed to results. Sometimes um, I'm interested in what your thoughts are on the performances and the results of the away games since January this year. So I missed the question. Since January. Since January. Since January. <coughs> I suppose I don't really, um, I can think of specific away games. And, um, you know, the one that hurts me, I, mean, I, I very rarely, I've only twice walked out of a game before 90 minutes. Well, I've done it three times. Um, once was Exeter, when Hill was in charge. And um, the changes, uh, and the score, certain players starting in the towel, just, I just had to get out. 
the if I look at Stephen this last year, that was the biggest worry for me because you know you looked at Stevenage and away from home, and they on the day they they wanted him more than us, and I walked out and I made sure that Mickey saw me walk out because he was suspended and in the stand, and I know that he went to them on the on the Monday and said to the players. Um, you know, and he had a go and he was having a real go so I've got to go and see the chairman. The chairman's going to say to me now, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to say to him, is that, you know, are, are, they, are they not going to come and not pick up their wages this week and pay their wages? Because they certainly didn't do it on the Saturday. I saw people jump out of tackles and stuff like that and I, I, I just can't take that. And I'm totally frustrated about it. We had the review straight after, and we keep talking about a tramway player, and we talked about a tramway player, what we want the previous season, and I saw a lot of those players there that are not wearing tramway players for me, because the one thing you do is you fight for everything, you fight for the shirt, you close down, and so forth and so on. Um, in terms of that, but that's very specific. In terms of the performances, what I mean is, I'm looking at the performances we've, we've got now, um, I haven't distinguished between the home and the way. And you know, that's something that we clearly had a problem with that last year. And uh, this year, I, you know, if I look at the performance of Salford, going backwards, great performance. You know, so that's quite useful because that means you move forward from where you were. Um, but that's one game, you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer. If I look at Lake Norient, uh, how many went to Lake Norient? Yeah, well, when we went to Lake Norwich, we beat um, Colchester here. Colchester saying they were the best team they said, keep going back to it, we've got three games. You know what I mean? And when you look where we are, and we've been in the past, and where we were in January and February and April, you just got to keep that perspective. So, it's not about perspective, I think the concern is that we seem to have run to run to run. people say it, we're in a new season, we don't play seven games, we don't play three games. I'm not looking at that, I'm looking at what, what's happened for weeks. Okay. Yeah, okay. I don't Team than us? Yeah. yeah. You did? Yeah, I did. 
ale čo to tak zvolá? No, 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 and it, it is a game of opinions. I felt that we were the better team and then they got a stormy on goal. And then actually when you go into the second half, we were still dominating the first 15 minutes of the second half. And then the game went into one of those dead periods and there were changes that were made and it was just, it became a nothing game, as they say. And they scored in the, in the 91st minute or something, it was a two more defeat. Now if they were the best team in the league, which is what we were told, I didn't think they were better than us on the day. And the results went better, and sometimes happens. Look at the other away games that we had. I didn't see the Newport game. But was it Newport? Yeah. I didn't see that. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, what were the other games away from home? Hartlepool. Hartlepool. I saw. It's a nothing game that one, as I recall. Uh, I think we had, I think we've missed chances. You don't think we've missed chances? Yeah. 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 We could have been two it up by half time. If you looked at um, just some bit of the games, but I think you know. So listen, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to change your opinion on it. You think there's a confidence issue? I, I agree that my concern was that because we weren't getting the points from the games, a confidence issue can come in at some stage. That happens, and, and the, the, the thing is that you, know, you just hope that you could have turned it before that. You know, he feels to make he's tried different things in terms of the way he's got them training on the pitch here before they go and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, um, you, you know, what changes games to goals? It's so stupid, but it, it is. And I think we miss chances when we get the chances. I don't think anybody's, apart from Stephen and Jim, all of us for 15 minutes, I don't think anybody's really dominated us this year. Newport, I didn't see. <coughs> But you know, I, I appreciate, I love the away fans. So, you know, I appreciate it's been a difficult job and basically following. But it's not something that the guys are unaware of. They're painfully aware of the fact they've got a poor away record. Uh, obviously. At least tomorrow we know the weaknesses on your at most so was defence with Peter Clark and Donovan Bandon. Peter Clark's on the right range. I think we need to move on to some uh, match day questions now, but if, if everybody's happy. Um, if we've got time at the end, we can come back to any any questions people want to ask. But I'm conscious we've had some um, emails in, one of which is about the speakers in the Johnny King's stand saying, can we get them replaced? They haven't worked for the majority of the season. This one, I have to say, is a complete mystery because we have tested them now on, I think, four occasions. Uh, once before the season started, when the speakers were replaced, and, and three times since. Um, and on a non-match day, they work, as our neighbours will contest, uh, attest to, because they keep complaining about why we're blasting out music in the middle of the week, and it's to test the speakers. Um, we don't understand why, we know it's not working on match day, because plenty of, of people tell us, so it must be something to do with Johnny the match Kane's day. He's not happy. <laughs> it must be something to do with the match day setup, that something's interfering with that signal, or somebody is turning off something wrong on a match day. So what we've got is the engineers coming back in for the match day, and they're actually going to do the testing live during the match, because at the moment, it is a bit of a mystery. It is every time we test it outside of match day, it works fine. And every time during the match day, it's not working. So that's what we're doing. We get them in on the match day to try and work it out. Um, the next question is one that comes up time and time again. Uh, is there any chance that we can bring back pay on the gates? 
Um, and the, the simple answer to that is we don't want to, if we can avoid it, for very good reasons, although trust and trust um, are still continuously in dialogue with, uh, with us about it. Um, since we moved to taking payments off the gates, the speed that we get people through the gates has gone up from, I think, a record of 177 a minute to 280 a minute now. We've pretty much eradicated any queuing from um, gates. When we first came, the first four, five seasons here, it was the constant problem. Oh, I didn't get in in time, the queues are hurting, <coughs> somebody sort the, you know, the systems out. Um, and that's been completely eliminated. There aren't any queues at the gates now. Um, the average amount of money that we get has gone up by uh, close to three pounds a ticket, and that's because, bluntly, it's eliminated a lot of um, the games that used to go on about, you know, 40 year old blokes who were paying a 17 year old price and getting through the gates. That that has stopped. And that's not that's not a family thing, that's not a dig at our fans. If you talk to any club <coughs> who's done this, they see exactly the same pattern. It's it's human nature, that's what happens. And actually, if you look at it, there is only one club left in League Two now that allows pay on the gate for home fans, and they only allow that for one stand. Actually, before anybody says I'm wrong on that, I think there was one club who hadn't replied to us on that. It, it has been pretty much eradicated at every club for the reasons I have just said. If you're doing allocated seating, if you want to eliminate the queues, if you want to avoid, you know, cash, the risk, just the risks of handling cash around the club. Um, so it would be sort of going very much swimming against the tide to bring it back. But we do take very seriously any issues that people have around, you know, we do hear reports of the odd casual supporter that doesn't want to go to the shop and buy a ticket and wants to buy it somewhere closer to the gates. We have, what, what I would say is that on any busy games, we also have a second place where you can just purchase on the day in cash or in card in the, uh, the tent. We have also put them the other side of the stadium if it was walking around that's the problem. But, but virtually nobody was buying there. Now that may be that it wasn't well known enough that they could do without having to walk around to the shop, I don't know. And this is why we are constantly talking to Trust and the Trust about it. Because, you know, believe me, we don't want anybody uh, not to be coming to a game because they find it a hassle to buy. But it is, um, you know, the, the, the statistics don't lie in terms of the benefits that we have got from moving away um, from, from pay on the gate. Um, a few other questions that I'm going to read that have been, um, have been coming from the email and then we'll take them from the floor. Um, why are the burgers wrapped in the kiosk units? Um, for a couple of reasons. Speed. Speed and consistency, it's to make sure that they're all exactly the same, they've all got everything in that they should the have. Questions. Not on these ones, I did on some of them. Um, uh, and, and it's just to speed things up. Uh, can we get a beer from all the kiosk units in the stadium? You can now, you couldn't before. Um, because we switched breweries, one of the main reasons we switched breweries is because they're the only big one now that does pets, the plastic bottles, so we can sell those very quickly. Um, so yes, now all of the units do do that. Um, we had a question, right, why we didn't have any water available at one of the kiosks at one of the matches. It was simply because it was in the middle of the heat wave, the suppliers ran out and could not, we had an order in, it didn't arrive, they didn't have any, so unfortunately there was nothing we could do other than make plenty of um, alternatives available. This one's my favourite. Can we have onions on the hot dog, please. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is, yes, the onions are coming back, so you can have onions on the hot dog. Um, and, and, <laughs> and then there, there is a question about why the food price has gone up this season. Well, you know, we do appreciate that everybody is suffering from a cost of living crisis at the moment, but so is every football club, and our costs have absolutely gone so through cut, the roof. Cut out the onions. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we, we have tried to avoid um, passing on uh, costs more than we need to. I was talking to the, the, um, the guy who heads our retail 
uh, yesterday, and he was saying that some of the prices that are coming in for stock for Christmas has gone up 40%. Uh, you know, which is just eye watering, um, and we we're absorbing a lot of that. But there have been some situations where we had to increase prices just because they've gone up. It's not just the raw supplies; it's also the labour costs um, that have gone up. You know, the rates even for casual stuff have, have escalated significantly because everybody is struggling with the fact that they just aren't um, enough around. And uh, uh, one more question on uh, match day. Um, before we go to the questions from the floor, is around our attendances um, and whether they've dropped and if they have, is it just us or is it across football? Um, this is where Mark was getting modelled up with this four, four games. We've only had four home games so far, as, as have most clubs. So you're dealing with a very small data pool to try and draw any, any statistically um, valid conclusions from it. Um, and yes, they are down a bit. I think in a cost of living crisis, you would expect that. At the end of the day, football is a voluntary spend, and there will some, be some people who simply can't afford it. But you can't. It's not really statistically valid. If you look across other clubs, you can you can get anywhere from up twenty or down thirty percent. Um, yeah, if anybody's on stats, it, it, you can't you can't draw any real conclusions from this. Um, Roughly about 50 percent of the league's drop prices and uh, drop numbers. Um, cost of living crisis performance. You know, if you if you lose your first game at home against Stevenage, uh, and then that varies. We've got four. We went up in four games at home, and we had um, last year we had four Saturday games. This year we've got a Tuesday game. Get the Tuesday game, and if you lose anything up to close to a thousand people. That therefore means that you know, that's quite a significant figure in four games. Um, so basically, I think the I think the last time we last season we had no Tuesday game until the twenty third of November. Not that now. So um, you just can't make a comparison from it. So the answer is that yeah, half the league seen reduced games. But you know, you see somebody a whole bunch of the team, but um, they've got a, a thirty five percent. Change increase in their gaze. Now, that's because of a tiny gaze. <laughs> so they've got three extra, and they made the thing. So I think was, guess what the that is. So, questions from the floor on match day. Evening. Um, Nick, you know, you, you, you touched on the cost of living crisis there, which obviously is a uh, bite into everybody's uh, pockets at the moment. I've noticed there's been a statement from Mansfield today regarding Saturday afternoon kickoffs at one o'clock. Would it be something that Sally would consider? It's not something we're keen to do because we're conscious of the disruption that it causes to fans. Um, and in the context of the energy costs over the course of the season, having the lights on for an extra hour, you know, on the floodlights, I don't feel is worth enough to cause the disruption to fans of, of change, you know, particularly for season ticket holders who've played for a whole season, if, if your work pattern doesn't fit in with it, I think it's, it's hard. So, I mean, we are trying very hard to look at ways that we can reduce our energy consumption, um, that we can reduce waste generally in the club because, you know, some of the increases we're seeing are fairly scary, but I think that one would be one that we would try and resist. Thanks for that, I've been asked by the media to talk on that, and I was going to say we were going to go to the deal more block it. No, I think the answer is you know, you've just got to work out the math. So I don't think it's that significant relative to the dislocation, as Nicky says. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've got pitch lights which burn a hell of a lot, which we have to do to maintain the pitch. We might tone that down, for example. You know, so if we, if we cut, the, 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 the usage of that will be quite a significant difference. Um, but it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's it's just difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, you're all suffering from the same as we are. But, um. It is, I mean, uh, one thing that I just would say on energy, um, and, and we'll touch on the new, new stadium proposal later, one of the problems that we have here is that this was built with 
zero insulation anywhere. So it gets cold very, very quickly. Um, and it costs a fortune to heat because it just dissipates out instantly. And trying to retrofit that is just not economical. It, you know, it would take 15, 20 years to pay back um, and so it's just not something that's viable at the moment. But it does make life difficult when you're trying to, you know, cut back on, on, on energy costs. Any any other questions on match day experience? <laughs> just going back on the match day experience. I mean, my kids are older now, but I'm just thinking about younger families. And this club is about bringing the kids through the club and support and, and giving them that match day experience which yourself has talked about is a massive issue that I read because I don't even buy the food from the outlets anymore I never since unfortunately you changed to cow shed catering I tried it once and vowed I'd never do it again um, <laughs> it was all because there was no onions <laughs> but the previous tenure was were low catering. That was dire. I think Cowshed's catering is sort of getting to that level. Um, why can't we, as how can I say it without upsetting people, be a smaller club, a, a smaller community club? Why can't we just go back to basics? Brioche buns and burgers and wedges or whatever they're given and tiny little portions is going to put mum and dad off when they've got two kids and the friends and the nephews and the cousins coming and they're trying to get them to come to the game because mum and dad want to come to the game. And then the little one wants, I want a burger. And then it gets too expensive and it's just not catering towards the kids. Yeah. We all know McDonald's, unfortunately, is a big name. It's basic food. Why can't we as a club go back to basic food and reduce our costs? But then I'm sure it'll bring more revenue in because parents will go, it's a little bit more affordable. So, uh, so I, I want to try and answer that. And I'm also going to push back a little bit on it because the sales of uh, cow sheds catering are the highest they've ever been by a very considerable margin. Now, we seem to have got, for some reason, a couple of images that do the rounds um, every now and then on social media, which are, fake. Which are in, in some cases, completely fake, not from this ground. Um, in one case, I suspect it was from this ground, but somebody's taken a picture of a completely plain hot dog in a plain bun. Well, that is because, in, in, in response to feedback, people said, don't put all the condiments on, let people choose what they want, so they have you know, an area where they do that. If somebody takes a photo of that... But it has an importance, because one of the important things you said at the beginning is, you haven't eaten at Cowshed's Catering for years, but you have got a very definite opinion that it's rubbish. And that's the problem a little bit that we suffer with because when we set up specifically a match day feedback group and we went out of our way to try and pick people with different demographics, with different sta uh, from different stands, and including people who we knew were fairly critical or, or you know vocal if they if they found something wrong with the club to give us feedback, and we asked them about the cowshed catering. And we couldn't get any of them to actually say anything, you know, they were all like, yeah, it's, it's actually not bad. Now, I'm not saying we always get it right, and we don't. And it has been hard recently because what every club is struggling with, and I was having a chat with the directors from Newcastle United when they were here, and it's exactly the same, is it's very difficult to get um, consistent staff. Um, because people just don't want to work in hospitality since COVID, and that's part of the reason around you know why we moved to to you know the, the pre-prepared products that's so that we can make sure that it's all done right. Because if you've got somebody who's never been there before and isn't entirely sure what they're doing, it, it can go wrong. So you know we are we're always willing and and really keen and, and you know rob is really keen to get feedback from people on what they like what they don't he introduced samosas um, um a couple of seasons ago partly in response to people wanting more vegan and vegetarian options 
actually they've gone down an absolute storm with all of the supporters, whether they want vegetarian or not, um, because they've been really popular. And it's really valuable to us to get that feedback. And we will listen to it. If people would rather not have brioche buns on their burgers and would rather have plain buns, then we'll get plain buns. And we need to maybe find a better mechanism to gather that data. But what is frustrating is when you get these odd things which appear to be just malicious, frankly, um, circulated that are fake and just become, you know, it, it becomes part of the folklore. I don't need a cow shed, but I've seen the photo on Twitter that said it was really shit, so it must be. And that, that is frustrating for the, for, the, for the people who work in there. So, I mean, if anybody can, you know, it, it, wants us to do something more widespread with the fan base around what do you want and what don't you. Um, we've changed it slightly this year to introduce a bit more variety so that different outlets are doing slightly different offerings so that we can cater to more taste. We are very small units so they can only do a fairly limited range in each one and previously they were all doing pretty much the same stuff so if you fancy something different it was, it was difficult to get the variety. Um, hopefully that is something that will go down well, so I'm very happy to get any feedback on that if it's not. Can I just ask, what more basic foods do you want than burgers and hot dogs? Because I don't know how much more basic it is. Yeah. I don't really understand what the question is, because it, it's just it, multi food, it, isn't it? Like it's, it's the most basic food you could possibly get. Yeah, so it's brioche buns, I've been told. I yeah. mean, I don't, I don't eat it. Um, so you get them in all the middle. Neto, if it's really so do I need to go and watch a football from Aldi and Little then? No, like, no, I think, I think, I think the point is it's, it's become very common that, that, that tastes have changed and a lot of people like those. As I've said, I don't eat the food, but my kids do, and well, they, they were doing every now and again. And it's just, it's what you're seeing and what, what you're hearing people. It's 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 in the ground. Why do you keep giving to your kids if it's so bad? I don't feed the kids at all, they must feed themselves. <laughs> Okay, you just said you get a few kids. No, I didn't. Do you this? I said my kids get yeah. them. Okay, no, no, listen, I can't, I can't tell you because no, no, we're no, happy. That's what I want. It's like me. My take on this, on this so far is that I've got down, down here there's top tips. No brioche buns, but lots of onions. <laughs> 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 Hang on, let's talk about uh, football. Any other match day questions? Yeah, Jim, can you give us a bit of We've got the World Cup coming up and there will be no other league matches going on. We've got two home games. Somebody mentioned it to me today. Are you looking at doing any sorts of promotions, not just over that period, but any other time over the season to try and get more people into the ground? I think it's a good question um, and we will be looking certainly at, at, at the whole sort of World Cup period because it's a bit of an unknown um, in terms of it may have an adverse effect on us in some instances depending on what games are going on in the World Cup that, that compete with our games and we don't know all the timing of those yet. Um, but certainly, yeah, if there is any opportunity to try and get, you know, try and convert a few Premier League supporters to, to becoming, you know, fans of, of lower league football, then we will certainly try and do that. We will certainly try and do anything innovative. Any suggestions people have got on, on what people would like to see um, would be gratefully received there. Because also, some of the stuff around the World Cup itself, um, we've had, we've, we've tried in the past to do various things where we put events on here. Um, you know, so that people can come and watch the, the, the big England games here. We've had a a fairly, I would say, big warm take up on those, so not that really taken off. If, if there's a better way that we can do it, maybe it's around doing it in the uh, the fan park rather than in the more formal rooms up here. But I mean, happy to, you know, get any any feedback on what people would want us to do over that period. Do you think we'll have any cross game in the future? Some sort of thing where we could have a look at how we got cross game in the well, we did reduce the, the prices quite considerably for that game itself, so that's what we did um, on on that one because they were they were um, quite a bit cheaper than the, the standard price. Yeah, and I'll tell you again now. We we um, suggested to Newcastle that what they would do is leave their share of the game with us, and then we drop the price, uh, which we have not. I think they hid behind regulations saying they need to get a certain amount from the game, but 
I like cats, I know what you can do with that. Just say, yeah, give us a gift with it or whatever, but they didn't do that. And just to put it into perspective for you, um, they brought on 140 million pounds worth of cost or value in terms of um, substitutes, because they were worried. And then started to have three men who were injured, just to remind you, just like they then showed again against Liverpool. Um, but just before kickoff, I think they signed a player that was probably 0.1% of what their share of the game was that they didn't make with us. But just to tell you that. That's quite poor, Mark, really, isn't it? When you consider that Man City have, have, have waved that in the past, I forget what, what club they play. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I yeah. think we should not never forget that, to be fair. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, um, they offered them the opportunity mm. to, to do what could have been a nice PR thing for yeah, yeah exactly. And and, uh, and <coughs> instead we took the hit on them, rather than charging full price upon them. Yeah. There is also, as, as Christine has reminded me, there's a rule in the league that you can't do offers for your home supporters that you don't also offer for the away supporters. So you've got to bear that in mind with any offer that you do, which, which, which actually we did for. Um, actually, that Newcastle game, the away supporters got the benefit of the same reduced prices as the home supporters right at the club game. Should we move on to the third section of questions from the. Yeah, so, so the third question is more about all the other stuff, so not, not football specific, not match day specific, um, and as you might expect, we've had some questions that have come in around um, the plans for a new stadium. Now, Mark and I have, have said before, we don't want to go into a lot of detail around that now, not because we're hiding from it, quite the opposite. If that ever really becomes something that we are seriously um, looking at, we want to have much more detailed debate with you know, a lot more information available to people. Um, but there are a, a few sort of broader themes that come up that, that we, we certainly can deal with, I will deal with. Um, one is around um, whether we would own any stadium that we move to. Um, and I think it's very difficult when we haven't yet got a feasibility study. We're talking about a hypothetical move to a hypothetical place and what it would look like. We have always been very conscious of the importance of or, or the value of owning your own stadium. And that's not something we would ever um, want to move away from if you could possibly avoid it. You can get into the argument if you have a hundred year lease on something, is that the same as owning your stadium? You're not technically, but you know, you are for the next hundred years and there aren't many stadiums that, that um, go beyond that. Um, we then got a question around the size, saying why are you looking um, to move to a new stadium if you can't fill the current one? I think it sort of misses the point of why we're looking at it. It's not about the attendances on the day, although all the stats around new stadiums show that you do actually get an increase in, in audiences if you build a new stadium. That's pretty consistent um, for everybody who has done. The primary driver is more about non-match day stuff because um, pretty much any football club will tell you now that the only way you can make a books balance is to have a business that's operating seven days a week, not, you know, 30 days a year, um, because the overhead is, the overhead is, it, it, it is big, and so it's about having something that is easier to develop football agnostic um, business from. Um, but now it's sort of over to you guys for anything, anything else that you want to ask us that we haven't covered this evening on any topic? Anyone wants to raise their hand so I know where you are? Anyone else after this question? Just so I know where we're going. Final question of the night then. Okay. It won't be about the ground move because I think that's that, that's fair gone down the road and, and, and there's a lot to be done before that. But I just want to applaud you for at least one thing of the many things, and that's having the Tammy ladies play prep Park so we haven't got to go to box or most just to see them. Uh, a lot of people ask the question to me, I haven't got a clue what the answer is, well there was 3,000 people that probably would last week, so why we have the Liverpool ladies play on the pitch instead of the Sammy ladies? Well I think that's probably got something to do with attendance. Um, I think it's important that we push the ladies, and I think it's very important that you should play at Brenton Park and we should support them. 
is this a one-off? Is this a gimmick? Or will you guys be looking to, to, to let them play there on a more regular basis? The first thing I'd say is that um, when I was at the FA, the lunatics were running the asylum. Uh, and the, the Premier League were basically running the asylum. And one of the things, because they were bust, what they tried to do was to cut costs. And uh, the obvious thing was they I went to a meeting with the ladies committee and they said right we're going to can the whole investment in ladies football. Well, at the FA you'd be looking after 40,000 clubs and we were the dominant sport in this country so if you're looking at it strategically how do you actually increase your dominance because you're there anyway. Play rugby has about two, less than 2,000 clubs. And the answer is, well, we continue to invest in women's football. So I protected the women's game, so I'm, I'm pro it. And uh, that was way back in 2003. When I came here, there were two things. I was looking at, you know, um, where do we start and what do we do in terms of um, getting the potential of the club. And the areas I was looking at was women's football and futsal, because they were two hereditary things that we had here at the club when we started and done. The facts of the matter are, in terms of getting the balance right between you know, achieving a, a break-even budget and, and so forth, is that Liverpool women uh, play here and pay a lot of money to use that pitch and to be the training ground. It's simple maths. You, know, you may be talking of a number of players' salaries. So if we had our women playing out there week in and week out, you wouldn't be able to maintain the pitch to the standard that we have it. That's about the limit that we can take on in terms of the numbers of games that we have and retain the coverage on the pitch. And sadly at this point in time, women's football isn't in the place whereby it's economic for the club. So you've just got to make priorities and balances. So they've done a fantastic job themselves and they looked after themselves and where we can help them, we will help them. We felt we could fit in you know, the odd game here and there. And we have to, under the agreement with Liverpool, and also in terms of the league itself, because you, they want to make sure you've got a, a proper standard pitch, you, know, you, you schedule out the games. And in any games that we play here, uh, we have to agree with them. Not our games, the first two games take priority, but actually women's games would, would be the type of thing. Charity games would be the type of thing that we'd have to look at. So it's difficult to envisage putting on the pitch again, but we actually felt it was quite a good way to help promote it. So I wouldn't call it a gimmick. I'd, I'd call it you know, it's a genuine way to try and help promote the women's game here. And in other ways, you know, it will come across the club you know, in terms of what we do. You know, if we develop the campus, for example, one of the things I want to do there, if we have like a 3G pitch there, is just dedicate that to the women's game, because it's a logical thing to do. You know, you're creating supporters, you're creating, it's, 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 you know, it's got momentum, and that's something we should look at. Can we advertise the women's games more than around the ground then, on our match day, so we know where the women are That's a good point, yeah. Um, I've just got to look at it, I'll point the finger at it. No, I mean, I, I hope you would have noticed this year that there has been a marked increase in it, and that is down to Hannah and a focus that we've got on, on doing that. And I think w one of the points to make though is that there is not a big push from the women to make Prenton Park their home at the moment. I'm sure they do aspire to having that happen in the future, but actually it's not a great atmosphere to play in if you've got you know a very small crowd in a very big stadium. You want to get a great atmosphere. By doing the odd game, and hopefully a lot of people will come out and support it. We can do that and build it gradually, but it's not its not something they're pushing for at the moment. Nick, is there a tipping point there? Is there a tipping point that if we all come out in force to watch the Tamil ladies, that as a financial point of view, we said to the Liverpool ladies, we've got our own, we've got our own supporters that will come no, out. No, I don't, I don't, I don't, I can tell you that I don't think that's mathematically feasible. Is it not that that's what, no, because of what they pay here. Okay. You'd have to, you'd have to we go don't know that, so. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not being trying to be funny about it. I can't say what the figure is because it's well, but to protect my confidentiality in the agreement and stuff like that. But I, I can tell you now, mathematically, it would never, I can't envisage that in my lifetime. Yeah, I mean, because I'm not going to last very long. <laughs> <laughs> in my lifetime, I, you know, I can't see that happening 
tudtam bejövőt őni. Bogdan Hunter, és az egyben a problémáim is, a szomszta is, tudta előtt, és a szomszta is, hogy a szomszta is, hogy a Just before we go, it's a question and answer session. So I'm going to ask a question of you lot. Who here boycotts the uh, Papa John's trophy? Unless you get to the comments. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. <laughs> so why do you boycott? I don't know why you boycott, but just tell me why you boycott it. Would you be asked to bring in the final? I don't think it has any. Well, you'd be asked to come in the final. Yeah. It's more. 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 I have a lot of sympathy for the views about, you know, bringing these up and trying to tweeze it. I, I think that's total bollocks. The LDV wasn't well attended. Pardon? The LDV fans wasn't well attended either. Yeah, yeah. No, but, you know, for the players themselves, it's, it, it was, you know, certainly my view, it was the only chance you ever get them to win. So it's fantastic. And you imagine they were too unhappy with the 2023 Sorry? Can yeah, it, 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 in fairness to the AFL, what they do is they try and try and make sure they don't. <laughs> but you know, for the club, it, it, it actually can be quite a money spinner. And you know, it, 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 and if you're talking about um, you want better players, you want to increase your budget, you know, it can actually think of the year we got to the final without crowds, which makes a difference. I think it was worth about three hundred and fifty thousand quid to us. Does it does it affect the players if the supporters aren't there for that cup game? Oh yeah. I mean if you play out there with a bit of a, a proper crowd as opposed to three stands and, and the players have stated that they feel different. Well I've never asked them the question, I, I just know from experience you won't feel the difference. <laughs> I was talking to the directors from Bolton the other night, and they're due to play Leeds um, not in, not in the next round. <laughs> they're, they're due to play Leeds in the next round, and Leeds have asked them for 5,000 tickets. Ooh. Now, that's a lot of money, um, you know, for, for, for any club at our level. I know, I know Bolton are League One nowadays, but, you know, it is a lot of money, and, and financially, actually, it's... It, it is an important game. I know it's not a, a, a one that's um, a favourite with the fans. And you're right that the old predecessor wasn't well attended and it was dying. And that's that's part of the reason why um, I think the EFL agreed to the changes. If you look at the League Cup, unless you have what we have this year, which very rarely happens on the League Cup, um, I get a television game. You don't get any prize money until we get to the semi final. So, actually, for us as a club, what's more important is playing the, the Papa John's in terms of financially for the club. The whole thing about well, 23 teams, I mean, I think I'm, I'm just dead against it. And I said to the, the chair of the FA that that was the stupidest idea he's ever had. That he was a great bike. Um, and he, you know, I, I'm against it. That's a fan. I never want to see it watered down at all. And I don't buy the, the fact that if they play on the 23 teams, it's great experience. You know, so they play one game or two games. You've got to play a season of men's football to, to actually get that benefit in your legs and your head. Uh, so, you know, for me, it doesn't work that way. And I, I, I can understand the politics of it, but you just got to look at we, we have to be in it. Right, we can't avoid being in it. So if we're in it, why don't we make the most of it? That's the suggestion. Mark. What's your thoughts on them changing the planning of the FA Cup and the replays? Oh, just, uh, because, I mean, just, just, did you, yeah, again. You know, you know what my answer's going to be on yeah, that. That's pretty stupid. It is. And it dev devalues the competition and it's pandering. It's everyone pandering well, to the Premier League. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, 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 you just, you, you've got to look at the, the Premier League. And my view of the Premier League, from when I was at the FA and right the way through, is that they play a long game, they bankroll everything, and eventually the league 
for, for long term, they give away the long term, the short term benefit. And this is another classic example yeah. of that. What you know, everybody's whinging about the size of the parachute payments, Rick Parry, the size of the parachute payments. You know, where did that come from? Well, sorry, Rick. <laughs> and actually, um, if you're looking at it, it was fairly obvious where it was coming from. They were trying to make a second division of the EPL. Yeah. Why were they doing that? Because there's no dead rubber in the Premier League. And so the television money's a great and that's great. Well, yeah, but what about the rest of us? No, so don't get me on that, I'll be on it all back. <laughs> so I think we've got one minute to go. Time for one. One last question, if anybody's got one. Yeah, yeah I'll go. Okay. Do you reckon Axel will have it from Axel? <laughs> 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 Is this going out to Wales? <laughs> 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 I can answer if you want. Yeah. Probably in some states. Do I think that what they're doing is right? I think Wrexham's a great old club. Many tussles and interests were kicked off, and Rufus from left to right, and so <laughs> forth. But you know, so you know, I like to see our clubs come back into the league. You know, the good old clubs coming back into the league. I'll, I'll say that. What I hate is the um, the fact that people spend money and create clubs that aren't real bits of their community, and I just think that's wrong. Um, and you know, some people are very hypocritical about that say all the right things but actually at the end of the day they distort the wages market and that hurts us and it hurts a lot of other community clubs that, because they're pumping the wages up and you know, so for me the fact that people put the money into a club that they can't afford and we've got a bid against that and you know, we've got players who'll be getting 3,000 quid and we lose out to them because we can't afford that that's damaging the pyramid. And it's, it, you know, the, the, the best phrase for it is financial dumping. And that was our thing, it? and it is. And, and that's the thing we've got to try and stop, I think. But how do you do that? Okay. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for coming tonight. Don't forget, you can get your Leeds ticket too for the apologies. <laughs> uh, but it was great to see so many of you, so thanks very much, and hopefully see you all soon. Thank you.